Well, hello there. My name is Brother Casey Cole, and this is Breaking in the Habit. This weekend, I went to the greatest show on Earth. Welcome to the greatest show on Earth! No, not the circus. Sadly, that closed last year. But my show recreated history right before my eyes with amazing theatrical performances, some of the most amazing music you've ever heard, and man, those costume changes. No, I didn't get to see Hamilton either, although you're getting close. My show's a little bit older, but is so exhausting and difficult to put on that they only do it once a year. All right, maybe I should just tell you, because you're obviously just guessing at this point. This weekend, I went to the Paschal Triduum of the Catholic Church. Hmm? Okay, I realize that this is a one-way form of communication here, but I can tell that you're not impressed. Either you have no idea what that is, or you know exactly what that is and you're a little disappointed that I gave a churchy answer. For people in both camps, hear me out, because as far as I'm concerned, it truly is the greatest show on earth. And yes, I know, as some of you will point out in the comments, the Triduum is not technically a show, but it's theatrical and entertaining, so go with it. Technically speaking, yes, it is a liturgy, a mass, broken up into three parts, and hence its name, over three days. Think of it like a dramatic play with three acts, one act each night. Only this play doesn't have a rapping founding father, but is in fact about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our own salvation. Interested now, huh? Well, either way, I'm gonna show you some videos I took. On Thursday, the Triduum begins with the Mass of the Last Supper. We gather to celebrate the moment when Jesus gave his disciples the Eucharist before he died. It also marks the official end of Lent, so that's pretty cool but also starts a more intense two-day period of fasting as we await Easter, so there's that. You can't win, can you? For Catholics, there's no real celebrating until Jesus comes out of that tomb. For this reason, it's not entirely celebratory, there's no Alleluia in the Mass, but it's also not entirely penitential either. The priest wears white and gold vestments, we sing the Gloria for the first time since Lent started, and the place is just packed with people that want to be there. I mean, come on, we're celebrating the Last Supper in the institution of the Eucharist, that's kind of one of the best moments in history, and we're not gonna pass up the opportunity to go all out with a big procession and joyous music. For the most part, the liturgy goes as any other would, starting with the readings and prayers in the Liturgy of the Word, leading to the height of the Eucharistic prayer and communion. But there are two things that are particularly special about this liturgy. The first is what is called the mandatum, or the washing of the feet. Remembering how Jesus removed his outer garment and lowered himself to wash the feet of his disciples, symbolic of how he was about to lay down his life for them, the priest removes his chasuble and alb and washes the feet of 12 people from the congregation. As someone who's had their feet washed in this ceremony before, I have to say that it is pretty powerful for everyone involved. Not only does it make present what Christ did, leading through service by laying down your life, it reminds us that we are called to go do the same for others. After this, the priest puts his garments back on and washes his hands, because, you know, feet. And the Mass goes as normal. Presentation of the gifts, Eucharistic prayer, Our Father, and communion. That is, until the very end. Because this is just the first act of an overall three-day liturgy, there's no official dismissal or definitive end. Instead, the priest, with his servers, takes the remaining hosts and processes around the church to a place where they'll be reserved, and the whole congregation is invited to wait in darkness. In the most literal sense, it's a reference to Jesus' prayer in the garden where he asked his disciples to wait with him. And so we do that, keeping vigil in prayer, trying not to fall asleep as they did.
Often, celebrations will lead the entire congregation out of the church to a special place of prayer where the host will be reserved overnight, heightening the experience that we are walking with our Lord. There's also a more practical reason for this in that we need to get everyone and everything out of the church before the next day. As we leave the church Thursday evening, we also leave behind the joy of the Last Supper, entering into the sorrow of Good Friday. To commemorate the passion and death of our Lord, we strip the church down bare. The tabernacle is left open, the altar left unadorned, decorations are removed, crucifix is covered, and all we're left with is an empty room with pews. Friday and Saturday remain the only days of the year that a mass cannot be celebrated. We fast, we mourn, and we wait. How could we rejoice on a day like today? No, all we can do is gather in silence. All we can do is recount what happened and pray. All we can do is ask, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Unlike any other worship service in the church, we gather without song, without a greeting, just the priest lying on the floor and all pray silently. Eventually he stands and says a prayer and the liturgy continues. After two readings in a psalm, like normal masses, the entire passion narrative is proclaimed, recalling every little detail of how Jesus was betrayed and murdered. Every once in a while we stop for a moment of reflection, to sing a song, to kneel in prayer. It's almost impossible not to be drawn into it. You feel as if you were there 2,000 years ago. And then, because we're Catholic and use all of our senses in prayer, we're invited to enter even deeper by touching the wood of the cross. One by one, we process up to the altar, taking a moment to touch with our hand, kiss with our lips the sign of our salvation. There before us is the instrument of death, the cross that he endured to give us new life, and we are given an opportunity to offer our thanks and our sorrow in veneration. Once everyone's had an opportunity to venerate the cross, the priest goes and retrieves the extra host from the day before, says the Our Father, distributes communion, and we leave just as we entered, in silence and in mourning. In some ways, it can definitely be seen as the boring part of the liturgy, especially when you compare it to what we did the night before and what we're gonna do the next night. There's no celebrating, no over-the-top music, no excitement or buzz like the other parts. But it can also be the most powerful part, especially in our overstimulated world. For an hour, maybe two, we declutter our lives and our church to place before us the only thing that truly matters, the cross. What good is singing and celebrating if there is no cross? What good is Easter if there is no cross? What good is being a Christian if there is no cross. Act two reminds us why it all matters, brings us down to earth and right in the midst of the pain of it all. This is why we need a savior. This is why we need new life. Because for a brief moment, we are led to believe that death has the final word. But it doesn't, does it? And man, does it bring such an amazing finale to this show, one like you've never seen before and one like you'll never see in this video. So here's the thing. I only have a few cell phone videos of the vigil. I know, I'm sorry, this was going so well and now I'm leaving the best part out. You might think it's because I wanted to enter more deeply into the liturgy and prayer, to experience it all, to leave the distracting camera at home so I could be, as John Mayer says, able to see the world through both my eyes. But you know that's not the reason. I would be standing up there right on the altar, in the way, getting the perfect shot if they let me. And to be fair, the pastor did let me stand on the altar for the whole mass. That's right, after being a deacon for only three weeks and serving at only one other mass before, the pastor pulls me aside the day before and says, hey, Brother Casey, you wanna serve Saturday night? I could really use the help. What, what now? You want me to serve the church's greatest liturgy with no prior experience on only one day's notice? Yeah, I'd love to. Now, for those who were in the camp before who had been to a triduum before and knows how it works, 
I have to confess that I didn't do all of the deacon roles, and for good reason. Liturgical rubrics are important and I understand them, but putting them aside for a second, there's really no reason why you would put me with one day's notice in to do important roles like carrying the Paschal candle or singing the Exaltet. Other people have been practicing those for months, and so I was happy to step aside. That said, it was still pretty awesome to serve in any capacity at my favorite liturgy of the year. For those who don't know, picture this. We begin the liturgy in darkness, just one giant candle processed down the center aisle. Holding candles in our hands, we all light from the one source of light and begin hearing the story of our salvation proclaimed by candlelight. From the creation, to the flood, to being delivered from slavery, to the proclamation of the prophets, we journey in the dark just as we as a people journeyed in the dark of our faith for so many centuries. We can hear the word and we can sort of see, but we don't yet have the fullness of the light. Then, all at once in dramatic fashion, the lights turn on and we sing the triumphant Gloria. The light has arrived and we can see. We hear the word proclaimed from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, reminding us that if we die with Christ, we also live with Christ, because he did this for us. And as if we're not excited enough at this point, the choir breaks out in the loudest and most joyful Alleluia you've ever heard, the first one we've heard in months, because the fulfillment of our hope is here. We proclaim the gospel, that Jesus Christ is alive. At this point, the church is electric. You can feel a buzz running through your body, and all you want to do is shout with joy, Alleluia, He is risen, we are saved. There's no more wandering through the desert, no more darkness, and no more death. Jesus Christ is alive. Ah, it's just amazing. And we're just getting started. After the homily, the priest calls forward by name all those who have been preparing for baptism all year, and with us standing there with them, they make their first profession of faith and are baptized into living waters. Now, I know this might come off a little dramatic, but standing up there holding the Paschal candle, watching the faces of the baptized and their sponsors as they entered the water, was one of the most incredible things I have ever witnessed. To see them with a little nervousness as they entered, to see the shock of the water hitting their face, and the joy as they exited dripping, completely soaked, and in new life. That's the joy of our faith right there. It was amazing. But wait, there's more. Along with the 13 people who had just been baptized, there were also more than 25 more who, having been baptized in another tradition, came forward and received the Catholic Church with the anointing of oil. Talk about a crowded altar, so many people entering our church all at once. But guess what? There was even more. As the astute Catholic will know, baptism and confirmation are two of the sacraments of initiation, but there's one more. Eucharist. Standing behind and next to and all around the priest and I, as the Eucharistic prayer was beautifully sung by the priest, I have to say, there were more people excited about receiving their first communion than you could shake a stick at. I have no idea what it must have been like to experience from the congregation's perspective, but from my perspective, whoa, it doesn't get much better than that. So much excitement, so many people hungry for faith. I know people want to say that the church is dying, that it's not relevant, but not there it wasn't. It was as alive as I've ever seen the church in that moment. At this point, we're about two and a half hours into the Mass, and everyone is a mix of out of this world tired and just hopped up on endorphins. And we finally get to the best part, the closing dismissal sung by the deacon. Leave it to me to have the very last words, not the beginning out of the way that people would forget. No, the very last important thing. I had six hours and three liturgies to think it over, to psych myself out, and to forget my one line. Luckily, I didn't do that. I missed a few notes along the way, I ran out of air by the end, but it was fine. Luckily, there's no footage of that, but for those who are interested, here's what it was supposed to sound like. The Mass is ended, go in the peace of Christ, Alleluia, Alleluia. And there it was, the greatest show on earth. It may not have had elephants or dazzling acrobatics. It may not have won a Pulitzer Prize for drama. And it may have only had one person wearing a sash, albeit on the other shoulder. But I can't imagine a dramatic performance 
more amazing, more enlivening, and more important to our lives than the celebration of our salvation at the Paschal Triduum. If you've never been, I cannot encourage you enough to consider going next year. It is a huge commitment, yes, and you will undoubtedly be exhausted by the end of it. But there is just no better way to celebrate the season of Easter and to reaffirm our place in Christ. May the Lord's peace be with you. Happy Easter. Hallelujah.